Our first sponsor for the podcast is Inverted Gear. Inverted Gear sells jujitsu equipment. They sell geese, rash guards, shorts, all that cool stuff. They're really cool people, really great customer service. They have a cool blog. Check it out. Go to invertedgear.com. Type in the coupon code SHOWTHEART15. No spaces. You'll get 15% off and you will enjoy what you get. Our next sponsor is Chimera Coffee. Chimera Coffee is coffee from Dominican Republic infused with nootropics. If you don't know what nootropics are, they're things that help your brain run a little quicker, fire the synapses a little faster, help you remember words better. Just Google it. Trust me, you won't go wrong. It's a great tasting coffee and uh, you'll love it. Go to their website, chimericoffee.com with a K, not .com with a K, coffee with a K, <laughs> and type in the coupon code show the art, no spaces, and you will get 10% off. Boom. Hello. Sifu Wetzel. Hey, 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 what's up, man? <laughs> Can I call you Shihan Wetzel? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means. I'm good. Nice. What's up, my brother? How are you, man? Good to hear your voice. You too, man. It's it's lovely to hear your tones. <laughs> uh, Abe's on. Hello, hello. Hey, what's up, brother? I think last time I saw you, we were having lunch at Curry House in Cyprus. Yeah, that was a while ago. That was actually the first time I had, uh, what was it, Thai food? Uh, or, or Indian it was food? Kind of a, it's kind of a hybrid, like, like Japanese something curry. I don't know, but it's fantastic. It's a fusion, <laughs> yeah, and you... Take, every time I went to California for the uh, clinics, you took me there every mm. single time. So for five years, I went there. And you threw That's up right. every single time. Nope. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> and I'm still rocking my sub four shirt that, uh, that you bought that one time. Uh, my oh, yeah. <laughs> my brother. You got to wow. get that I show the that. art sh- shirt now. I know I do. I, I rock the hoodie, though. Yeah. He rocked it in his uh, videos. Oh, his rap videos? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. They just dropped fresh new tracks. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. So what's going on? Um, a million things all at once that I'm trying to juggle, as usual. Right. And you got the Red Zone DVD in process, in production? Oh, dude, there, there are so many things. Like, over the last, um, I don't know, I guess about the last two years or so, ever since the, the book came out, like the red zone program's kind of blown up mm. and so now like just this year i'm traveling so much with it and trying to juggle that and then running the gym full time it's been interesting nice. nice and what is the red zone uh well it started off let's see i've been i i came from let me back up a half step um i came, out, came from a jkd background but i was always kind of interested in in like self-defense self-preservation type stuff so everything that i did was geared more towards what would actually work in a fight as opposed to uh, combat sport. Okay. And so I was doing that, I don't know, right after high school, so just just before uh, the first UFC happened. And then when that happened, everything got flipped around and, uh, you know, hoist blew everyone's mind. Um, and so everyone was like, okay, we need to get some grappling in there. And so I started looking for grappling schools, and the guys that I was training with, uh, they went and trained with Hickson in Laguna Niguel, and because in Southern California there wasn't a, a lot then. And you trained uh, and with I was uh, I was, you trained with Ken Shamrock. No. I trained with Ken. No, no. <laughs> I trained with Boss. Oh, nice, Boss. Okay. Yeah, he was he was teaching down at Beverly Hills Jiu Jitsu uh, with like Oleg Takarov, Marco Hulas, and a bunch of guys were all like crammed into one little school down in Beverly Hills. Amazing. And so I would tr- travel down there and and kind of get my grappling in, which in hindsight my time might have been better spent from a grappling standpoint, doing jiu-jitsu, but I was a huge boss fan, and so I got some good training in there and good stories. But Palm strikes to the uh, liver. <laughs> exactly. Um, so anyway, so then I, I started adding that stuff in, and was still trying to kind of figure out how the whole cross-training thing was going to go, and, and continued on my training journeys, and eventually started teaching out of my garage, and then in 2001, uh, I opened the gym, because my wife was like, when that was when I got married, and she's like, "Yeah, well, you're not teaching out of the garage." That's funny because, like, uh, that's a classic old school martial arts thing. Like, you start with training in your garage, and then you gain a couple students, and then you grow and open up a, your own school. Like that garage gym is so classic. 
Fair, well, no, even before that, I was teaching at parks. Oh, mm. nice. That Tai Chi flow. I was living in an apartment, so I had like a gear bag in my car, and I had some guys that knew I trained, so we'd go to the park and do stuff. Mm. Cool. Right in and the grass, there, like in the meadows? <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> And cherry blossoms falling, and <laughs> blowing. right at dusk, and like the the, the, exactly. light, <laughs> the light is just overflowing everybody's chi. Everyone's illuminated. Awesome! <laughs> it's so beautiful. Yeah, there's more just like a bunch of dudes sweating and bleeding with grass stuck to them. <laughs> oh, people like show, you know, sh- you know, moving their kids along, trying not to look at the idiots you know, wrestling <laughs> around on the grass. <laughs> Uh, right. So, but, uh, uh, go ahead. Anyway, so so along the like, so while I was doing doing the the combat sports stuff, I was still from the JKD background, kind of doing uh, weapons defense, knife stuff, and things like that. And because I was trying to figure out what would actually work in reality, we started to move away from. And there were a couple pivotal moments that that were kind of eye openers, but we started to move away from the the more traditional approaches to the training and starting to kind of give, give someone a training, blade, give my brother's punk rock friends a training blade and just come at me, bro. Kind of thing. <laughs> my brother's friends were idiots. So they were trying to show that the martial arts stuff didn't work. But when they started coming at you for real and trying to make it look bad, a lot of stuff fell apart. And so we had to change how we were approaching stuff. Um, and we kind of evolved. And then the red zone knife defense program was kind of born of just trying to figure out what works under maximum pressure. Mm. Okay. And, and, and then from there, you know, things just kind of continue to grow. And, and so it's like 2003 now. And that program, uh, kind of started to build momentum slowly over time. Um, and this is a self-defense program you're saying? Yeah. Purely yeah. Well, self-defense. At the time it was just a knife defense. Okay. Yeah. Red zone. Yeah. So that that's kind of how it all started was based on like, like just out of necessity, put together a knife defense program, uh, and that started to gain notoriety for being very functional. At, and and people in the industry started to say nice things about it. Uh, nice. People in the self defense industry started to say nice things about it. <laughs> um, and then, you know, we so we eventually. I don't know when when did we meet? Uh, I have to say, uh, like two thousand eight, nine, ten. I think it was no, eleven. That's probably like, okay. He knows yeah, so, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> was I still at the, the at the old gym at the red and black gym, or was I at the bigger gym? Yes, the red and black. Okay, so yeah, then I moved to the the bigger gym in '08. Okay, so yep, it would have been like '07, '08 doing that. Mm. Um, yeah, so I continued on like with the gym was was straight up combat sport, so. Boxing, kickboxing, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, in like 2003, my buddy Adam Singer was like, uh, hooked, uh, introduced me to a bunch of guys in the Straight Blast Gym. And Matt Thornton told me, Oh, you, my coach, Chris Howders in Southern California, you should meet him. And so I brought Chris in, and Chris is teaching out of my gym, and that's how we met. Nice. Um, and I've been training with him. I've had, you know, exposure to other coaches, but he's been my main coach since then. Um, and I'm a brown belt under Chris. Nice. That's that's awesome. Oh yeah, nice. So it's still cool. a little surreal. And Chris getting a lot of press these days. So I'm, you guys are gonna have him on, I'm sure. Of course. Uh, there's many JKD factions. You got the original June Fanners. You got the JKD Concepts. Uh, the Straight Blast Gym, which was what functional JKD back in the day. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, you went through all of those. Did you go through the JKD Concepts and? I started off with. Like the the JKD concepts guys, but Paul Vunak was my coach. <laughs> that maniac. So he's already a bit of a nut job, and and he had a very focused kind of street oriented thing there. Right. Um, but he was also very uh, committed to Dan and Asanto. So I had a lot of interactions with a lot of concept type guys. Mm. Um, and so that kind of that was my intro to it. So I was I was fortunate enough that the my my upbringing in, in the JKD community was geared more towards integrating other stuff as opposed to just trying to replicate what Bruce was doing at a specific time. Uh-huh. Right. You know, so it kind of, it fit in line and in, in with where I was trying to go anyway. So it worked out. Mm, nice. I have a question about 
to backtrack a little bit, and, and I don't want to cut you off, but the red z- your red zone knife fighting system, right? That's that's essentially what right. it is. Um, some some not pe- knife fighting, but knife defense. Knife defense. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> some people will say, "Well, how is that practical?" It's not practical to walk around and face someone that is going to try and rob me with a knife. That rarely happens. So how would you convince those people that, no, this is very practical. This is very necessary to train in. And it's it will build much more than just defending yourself in a situation like that. Oh, no, I, I totally hear. Um, I think that the problem that a lot of people run into is, is either you, you kind of walk that that razor's edge of am I being paranoid if I start training this stuff? Like how you know how much is really going to happen? And then just trying to deny it. It's, oh, this will never happen to me, so why bother? Yeah. But why have car insurance? Why take a CPR class? Okay. Okay. I've been CPR certified for years. I've never had to do CPR on anybody. Thank God. Perfect. No. <laughs> okay. And I know now that I you know I have two kids, it's nice for me to know that should something happen. I'll know how to deal with it. Gotcha. And I think what I would do, that's how I, I liken all of the programs in Red Zone Threat Management. So the Adaptive Striking Program, the Knife Defense Program, Red Zone Prime, all of those things are kind of geared towards uh, like a modular approach. So the idea is that I'm not trying to turn it into some drawn-out, convoluted martial art. Knife defense is a very specific topic, okay. and the goal should be how little do I need to know in order to be able to deal with this? It's a very specific problem yeah. with very specific answers. Mm-hmm. And a lot of what combat athletes train applies to it. I think a big problem in the self-defense community is you get people who don't train the way jiu-jitsu players do, the way boxers do, the boxers do, um, and they're looking for a sweet move that's going to that's gonna solve their problem. And then they collect all these sweet moves in a bag and think that they're going to be able to access those but they lack the training methods that combat athletes have. Okay. Getting in there, grinding it out, finding the, the balance and the resistance. Even but if you do that and you have an understanding of what a real attack is, you can learn this stuff very quickly and, and get to a functional level with it to where it'll handle most of what you're likely to run into. Sure. And then you have it. Yeah. And then you move on with your life. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's not, I'm not telling people... If you want to learn to defend against a knife, now you have to commit to years and years and years and years of things. Uh-huh. Okay, figure out what the, an actual attack is going to be. Figure out what your options are, what you can do, what you can't do, how to find exits. Yeah, and then move on. See, uh, I, I like that concept because one of the things I always tell the students is, guys, you know, you're starting out in jujitsu or or muay thai. Knowing a little goes a long way when you're dealing with someone who knows nothing, especially martial arts when you first start training. So if, oh, yeah. you, if you know five, six months worth of jujitsu, that's very basic level stuff, you have a huge advantage, a big gap drawn between you and someone out in the street that knows nothing about jujitsu. Dude, when I was starting jujitsu and I was like all white belt and I'd get on a match on the mat with a blue belt, it felt <laughs> like they were magic. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just like I didn't even know when I was in trouble until it was too late. Sure. It was scary, but it was intriguing too and now that you're a brown belt how do those blue belts feel <laughs> <laughs> uh well i'd like to think that they feel the same way but you know <laughs> i but, just try to focus on my own game but yeah getting back to that uh another another concept i like to follow i read it from a, a book by tim ferris he talks about what is the minimum effective dose med what is the li- yeah. the, the the minimum i information i need to know to get the maximum result and i don't want to necessarily breach that because then I, I might be wasting my time um and i think like you, you're saying like you don't have to spend all day doing knife defense stuff and you don't have to spend oh, 10 no. years doing it but what is the minimum effective time need spent training in that methodology that would be very effective in a real world situation no, I think that's a beautiful way to put it. I think it's, I think that's excellent. It's right in line with with my thinking on it too. Okay. Um, especially, I mean, if you're a martial artist, if you're somebody who trains in in several disciplines, you've got to divide your time wisely. Okay. If you're if you're a career martial artist, you know, if you're Dan in the Santo, so you're just going to go out and learn whatever just because you love martial arts. Uh-huh. That's different. But if you're trying to focus on 
function and things that require like force on force type training and sparring and things of that nature, then we really do have to shave down what we take in to whatever is essential as opposed to superfluous. Sure. And then there's also the uh, emotional uh, component, losing your wits when the chaos starts happening. And then you oh, have. Oh, sure. Yeah. And, you know, so it, it comes out, like, I don't want to focus on the knife the whole time, but when you talk about the realities of, of, of self defense, then, yeah, when weapons come into play, that's a huge determining factor. But, and that's what, that's one of the edges. Because, you know, there used to be, like, this whole street versus sport debate. Uh huh. You know, where guys are like, oh, I train for the street, so I don't do that, that, that sports stuff, that UFC stuff, because <laughs> in the street they'll gouge you and they have weapons and friends and blah, blah, blah. Sure. And then you had the flip side, all the, the guys who train combat support are, oh, you're all a bunch of paranoid nerds, and you know, you <laughs> run around your camouflage pants. And you know what? They're both kind of right, but they're both missing the point. It doesn't need to be adversarial. Yeah. Right. Because there, there are differences between a match fight, you just do boxing, kickboxing, MMA. And a street fight. But, and, and my buddy Paul Sharp says this very well, if you can't beat me with rules, what makes me think, what makes you think you can beat me without rules? Mm -hmm. So true. And, yeah, it is. And what combat sport allows is a foundation in training under pressure for somebody who's trying to punch your face, choke your neck, etc. Ah. Um, and getting used to that, getting in there. Because you can learn all the deadly sh dim mock strikes you want, okay? <laughs> The dim mark. Or at least all the ones that I'll teach you. I'm not teach you all of them, but I can teach some myself. The five-point exploding but, heart technique. Yeah, see, that one's for me. That's, that's, that's <laughs> my get-out-of-jail-free card when, you know. <laughs> you don't teach that to students. No, 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 no. They'd have already used it on me. We wouldn't be having this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but if you get all of those, if you get all of those, you, you get a handful of a functional techniques, you said that minimum, uh, what did you say, what did you call it again? Minimum what you call it? effective dosage. Yes, you get that minimum effective dosage, and then you have good training methods. You get in there, you train with resistance, you troubleshoot, you avoid injuries. Mm -hmm. You got to have good training partners. Yeah. Then you can actually develop a functional level of skill. True. And that going, <laughs> that's a long ass answer, but <laughs> that that brings us around to what is red zone? Well, red zone threat management, my my company, whatever. Okay. Uh, the other side of what I do because I have the MMA gym, and then the other thing I do is is a lot of traveling doing seminars and stuff on this kind of stuff is based around that minimum effective dose and then how to train this material effectively. Okay. Okay. So not just me learning the cool moves and now I have my move if a guy does this to me mm -hmm. or a guy does that to me, but here's how you have to train. And part of that is you've got to get some reps and you've got to ha learn how to train this kind of material in a realistic setting with solid resistance. Sure. And I feel like... That's something that's missing um, in most sport jiu-jitsu academies. And I feel like when I used to train more street self-defense kind of combative martial artists, yeah. martial arts like Filipino martial arts, Kali Silat, using hands and defending against knives and sticks and stuff like that. I feel like when I used to train that and we would drill individual techniques, we used to, tr we used to drill a lot quicker, a lot more intense than I do now when I train, let's say, jiu-jitsu, and I'm drilling jiu-jitsu, or I'm drilling, uh, you know, uh, Muay Thai combination or something like that. I feel like if you carry over the intensity of drilling when you're drilling those street fight, those self-defense techniques over to sport jiu-jitsu, you can be a little bit more effective because now you're used to more intensity. Yeah, I, I think to a degree. I think the thing is, though... Um that I learned with a lot of the the stick fighting type drills and things like that is a lot of times it's formatted. It's not, we're not trying, there's no resistance. It's just you're going faster and harder, but you're still not. There's no timing in there. We're still not. They're still not resisting. And, um, and, and one it's of the a things that you get to. I'm sorry. And it's a set pattern. A lot of them are flows yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Whereas in jujitsu, I'm having to do this for real. And even if I'm doing it at a slightly slower pace, I'm still kind of working out that timing and that movement. Um, but, you know, Kurt Oskander always goes off about, about, you know, the current state of jujitsu and how some people get a little too, um, 
sissy about it, a little too, oh, where everything's flowy all the time. There is a part where you got to bang, right? Yeah. You have to bring the intensity and make sure your stuff holds up. Not all the time, especially, you know, at, at my age, I'll, I'll start to get rickety. <laughs> so how do you, how do you, how do you train that? How do you say, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to stop having my jujitsu be a little too sissy and be a little rough. Am I just training a little rougher? Like, am I, are me and my training partners going to say, hey, today we're, we're going to try to be a little bit more rough than we're normally used to, a little bit more grinding? Yeah, and I think, I mean, depending on the situation, if you're dealing with your training partners, then that's all, that's, that would be optimal because you can discuss it with each other. Yeah. If if you're training in a classroom setting, then you'll have, you know, you'll have, you'll have certain guys you can go a little rough and, hey, man, so let's, let's turn it up a little bit. Yeah. Okay, and then when you're rolling with some other guys, you got to be chill because they're at their own place in their journey. Sure. But, yeah, I would do that. And if you're talking about self-defense-specific stuff, uh-huh. um, that's where, you know, either you set up a workshop at your gym and, you know, you run one where you could talk about applications of these specific techniques as they apply to an actual fight and put the boxing gloves on, let the guy throw some bombs, you know, and you kind of sit over the top of that so that you make sure that it's still holding up under that pressure. Because hard to say, but, and don't get me wrong, I love jujitsu, but some of the self-defense stuff taught in, in jujitsu stuff is, is, will not hold up, you know? Mm-hmm. Some of the wrist locky kind of arm, standing arm bar stuff. Yeah. Okay. So how do you... <laughs> you put some gloves on John Wayne Carr and you try and you try to <laughs> do some of that stuff to him while he's trying to punch your head off. Oh, yeah. go. <laughs> how do you sift through the self-defense techniques or the the self you know the advertised self-defense techniques and let's say in let's say jujitsu because that's what we're talking about as opposed to the non-self the the sport techniques like when let's say you're at a school and you're a blue belt you've been training at your at your academy and whatever's land for two years Uh and your instructor who's a black belt in brazilian jiu-jitsu is telling you you know every tuesday we're going to work on self-defense techniques and then those self-defense techniques, how do I trust that he knows what he's talking about as far as what works and what doesn't work in a street fight when the guy maybe never has gotten into a street fight in his <laughs> life? How do you, how do you trust those people? You know what I'm saying? Martial arts gave me trust issues. <laughs> okay? <laughs> now, so many times, you know, you're like, I trust you not to punch, your head, punch my head off. You some jackass folks to tear you up. Or, you know, I... I trust you to teach me functional stuff, but then every time you try and do it with resistance with your buddies, it doesn't hold up. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's an issue. I, and I don't trust anybody. I, what happens is as you train this stuff, or as I've, what I've learned, I should say, uh, as you train this stuff more, you start to develop an eye for it or a feel for it, okay. right? You can watch a YouTube video of some stuff that guys teach, and you're like, that wouldn't work. You yeah. know, you know immediately. You watch, you watch other people you know, you, you watch a karate guy trying to mimic jujitsu stuff, but you can tell he's just mimicking it. It's not his art. Sure. And you go, okay, he's he's missing this piece. You would escape the armbar here because he's not, you know, it's on the head or whatever. Okay. Um, I think my point is, but, how can, not that I don't trust you. I'm, I'm not saying that. But, you know, to sell yourself, to sell Red Zone, how can, how can people trust you to know that you know what you're talking about? You know what I'm saying? As far as yeah, teaching no, self-help techniques. That's, and that thing, you know, since we're on we're on STA, my you know, talk about my my ongoing love story with jujitsu specifically. <laughs> so, um, I'll back up a bit. Chris Howder get I get introduced to Chris Howder, he comes and starts teaching at my gym. Um, at the time I'm a stand up guy, uh, in terms of striking. That's that's my preference, that's what I was doing. Um, but I understood that to be well rounded, I needed to get some grappling. I've had enough experiences. I you know, training with boss. Uh, I still preferred the stand up, but I learned a little bit, but not enough to help me against the good blue belt. And so I was I was doing the ground training if necessary, evil, and did good, did good, did good. Uh, got my purple, and then kind of stopped training jujitsu for a while. I was running my gym, focusing on building the business, doing all this stuff. Okay. And in the in that time, I'm also teaching and kind of evolving my approach. What would later become part of the Red Zone Prime program, the, the adaptive striking program, kind of my approach to self-defense. And then, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago, things started to click and connect together. And it was 
because of a lot of the training that I was doing, I was starting to fall back into jujitsu and fall back in love with it. And it's like the love story in the movie with the, the girl that's always right there, but the guy never really realized it. And so, you know, all of a sudden he pictures, oh my gosh, she's right here before my eyes. And that's what it was. So many of the things that we do in jujitsu, so many of the things, uh, the concepts and the, the, the tactics that are in jujitsu are uh, apply across the board. And when it comes to self-defense, there are certain things that, Sport or street are constant. And if you train in a combat sport, you have an appreciation for training against resistance and being able to do this stuff for real. And then you just add the dirt on it. You just figure out how to do this stuff when they're trying to punch you or if they're trying to access a weapon okay. or how to disengage and find exits or how to deal with multiple opponents. But you do it with resistance. So, uh, and I was, I was messaging Marcus here there when we were talking about, uh, uh, those sort of universal, Martial truths. Mm-hmm. Those things that hold up, I know it sounds very pretentious, but <laughs> those things that hold up across platforms. So street, sport, uh, yes. or you know, sport specific or MMA, um, and then across styles. So something like elbows in, elbows yeah. always in. Jiu jitsu, boxing, um, shooting, okay? Everything, everything. It's one of those things that's, that's a constant across the board. You always need to keep your elbows in, yeah. in and down. Works for takedown defense. Works for uh, protecting yourself in posture in the in uh, on the ground. Protects your body standing up. Mm-hmm. Keeps your hands in tight for drawing a weapon. All of those are constant. Okay. Well, one of those things, and one of the kind of the cornerstones of what we do in the red zone program is dealing with things like uh, position, posture, pressure, uh, angle. Okay. If you look at things like angle. So we understand in, in boxing, you're always trying to find that good angle, the outside angle, trying to stay away from the rear hand, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, in jiu-jitsu, you already know how all of that applies. But even in the pre, uh, pre-physical pre areas of a street fight, when guys are just talking trash back and forth, you're still trying to create angles. Of course. You're still moving away from the rear hand. I don't have my hands up, and I'm not in posture to fight, but I'm still looking to create an angle. Mm. Things like controlling pressure. Okay. As soon as we fight, one of the things I started to realize, again, this coming from a guy who, who, for years preferred to do striking, realized that it's a very, it's a very risky proposition to try and rely on your striking in a street fight. Sure, it's a necessary component for sure. But I've been rocked. I don't know, if Marcus. I don't know if you've had experience in eight. I don't know. Do you do stand up or do you just do just? Yeah, we play <laughs> around with the, uh, we move around. Yeah, we've been, yeah. We, I've been we've rocked dabbled. by guys who suck. <laughs> okay. Cause I got the clown in a little bit and playing and yeah. some guy, you know, newbie who wasn't looking through a hand to hit me in the back of the head. Sure. And buckle my knees and I'm trying not to let him see that he wobbled me. Uh huh. Of course. Okay. But look, just having more skill doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to win. And when we're talking about a street fight, uh-huh. it's just, it's a flurry. Yeah. So and you it, start to realize that. Standing in that mid range, standing where the breakers are, or where the where the waves are, worst place to be because I'm gonna. It's too risky in there. He can hit me with stuff. Plus, you're talking about street fight. He may have a weapon in his hand. Uh-huh. Yeah. So I'm right. better off crashing, tying up, and dumping him. Okay. Yeah. Even if I'm not gonna grapple, then I am trying to stay in mid range and hope I can outstrike him. Sure. Yeah. It's funny that you say that, and I'm glad you said that because it kind of goes along with what what I've always kind of strategized in my head. If I did get into a street fight tomorrow and especially when students ask me what i would do i tell them guys you know you don't want to take the chance with a wild swinger in a street fight they don't know angles they don't know anything so you're expecting the correct angle you're expecting the correct punch i've been training with guys that are punching the right way so when somebody throws a punch the wrong way i might not be expecting that angle and i might get hit so my best chance is to crash close the distance, clinch, and then do my, my business there. I'm exactly. glad that you said that because it, it, go, you know, it confirms what I was already kind of thinking in my head. Mm-hmm. Thanks for saying that. Yeah, it, I sent you the book. It's actually, I kind of outline like, the, the whys and wherefores in the Red Zone Prime book um, mm-hmm. on, on that approach and why I think that's such an important element. And, and it's cool to hear you say that, too, because... You know, when you talk about how do I trust a uh, jiu-jitsu instructor, uh-huh. th- and I'm talking to a jiu-jitsu instructor that gets it. Ah, gotcha. It's all about the concepts, you know, the ideas. Absolutely. And as long as you, you see how the stuff your stuff holds up in the different contexts, and you're training those contexts 
appropriately, then we're good. Because you get guys who will be like, okay, we're going to do a street fight thing. So here, come at me like this with this move, and I'll do my street fight defense. Okay. Like, well, the whole, the whole danger in a street fight is that you don't know what's coming <laughs> or when. The or unpre- unpredictability. Right. The what? Unpredictability. <laughs> yeah. The unpredictability. <laughs> Paul? <laughs> Starting to scat it. <laughs> Shoot, what was I saying? No, we were talking about like you, your strategy in your book and closing distance and how effective that can be. Oh, right, right. Yeah, kind of crashing and tying up. Yes. And all going back to the striking thing, that's what we're talking about. And again, yes. I, I, I dig the striking thing. I teach it. I teach it every day. And it is effective. You do need to know how to hit. You need to know how to deal with someone trying to hit you. Okay. And that's one of those things. Is you can say, okay, well, my plan is not to not to stand on the outside. I and mean, that's kind of the, the jiu-jitsu goal for the most part, right? Yes. Crash, tie up, take them down, pass guard, mount, take them back. So, but if you've got a guy who knows how to stay on his feet and knows how to change levels and knows how to use his hands, uh-huh. it's not that easy. So sometimes you do need to know how to strike. You do need to know how to deal with a guy who's striking you. Sure. But what to happen when you tie up and he just kind of instinctively frames up and you can't finish the, you know, can't close the deal there. Okay. And that's where the adaptive striking program comes in. It's kind of those, Spaces in between the notes. Mm-hmm. So the standing T-shirt chokes, dirty box, and let us know about my game. Oh. Uh, so you, <laughs> you you advise in uh, whether it's Muay Thai class, Savat class, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu class, any one of these classes that whether there's punches or not involved in the martial art, we should be training how to defend ourselves from like in Jiu Jitsu. There's no punches or kicks in the martial art, but. Every Tuesday, we should be going over when somebody throws a, a wide hook at us, what we should be doing, how we can adapt our jiu-jitsu to those real-life street fight situations. Because I think one of the most common things that can happen in a street fight is somebody squaring up and swinging a hard right hand because most people are righty. Mm-hmm. So defending against that kind of, that kind of attack, that, that's very necessary. I absolutely think you should... If, and I'm not here to tell people, I mean, train, whatever you want to train, train Taekwondo, train Tai Chi, whatever. Yeah. But if you're going to put on your sign, we teach self-defense, then <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Boom. Otherwise, don't call yourself a self-defense instructor. You could say, uh, I teach, you know, sport jiu-jitsu, but don't say you teach self-defense. Yeah. Mm. If you're not teaching to deal with how fights start, like you said, and I, you said it in, in, oh, by the way, I've listened to all of your podcasts. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I just kind of listened to one after the other while I was doing stuff. Uh, <laughs> in your, in the last one, you talked about how, if not 100%, close to 100% of fights start standing up. Yes. Right. You've got to learn to navigate that. And then beyond just having a person throw a hard right hand, don't, t- don't make it a right hand. What do you mean? Have the person learn to deal with the unpredictability. So you learn to have them defend against someone trying to throw something at them. Gotcha. Could be a headbutt, could be a right, could be a left, could be an uppercut, could be an overhand, uh-huh. could be just a crazy windmill punch. Yeah. But make sure that whatever we're crashing on is their intent to hit me. Right. Or dare I say, stop hit them or intercept. Intercept. Ooh. To bring the conversation full circle to the whole Bruce Lee thing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I understand that. But, that makes total sense. Yeah, because the problem is if, if we go, because you're right, most people are right-handed. A big right hand is a big... I go on YouTube, look at Street Fights, most of us are right hand. So it's important to have an option for that. But since I'm... I may not... My mind is going to be in a million different places. If I think I'm going to be in a fight, I'm not used to being in a fight. Yeah. Which I'm not. I don't get in a lot of fights. Then I kind of want to multi-purpose whatever tactic I'm going to use so that it works regardless of what hand they're throwing and stuff like that. Gotcha. Right. And another thing I feel like we we should think about when we're training self-defense... And again, I'm no expert. You're the expert by all means. But this again, this is just something that uh, I think about. It's somebody, If you get into a street fight with somebody, you, Jerry, someone who, who's a, a peacekeeper, who doesn't try to get into street fights, who talks his way out of street fights, someone like myself or Marcos, people like that, good, good people. Normally, if we get into a street fight, we're probably getting into a fight with somebody who has been in street fights on a regular basis or way more than we have, right? Someone who's oh, picking yeah. a and fight with you. Huge. Yeah. So more than likely, they have experience in street fights throwing punches and kicks, right? More than, yeah. <laughs> so, but what they don't have experience in is clinch game, grappling game in a street fight situation, which is something that we train more often than none if you're a jujitsu guy. if you, So 
my point is take them out of their strength that street fighter his strength is is punching and and keeping distance naturally because he doesn't want to get hit and he wants to hit you so just by clinching and 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 crashing the boards and getting in close and trying to take them down or whatever you're taking them out of their natural strength anyway absolutely i think i think you touched on a very important point right there which is the closer I am and the more attached I am, mm-hmm. the less often they have and the more control I have of what's going on. Yeah. Now, a, a caveat, you know, a, a word of caution okay. to the two players. One, if we're talking about self-defense specifically, we do have to consider the fact that weapons are used in a lot of assaults and that more often than not, they aren't seen. So what I thought was an overhand or what I thought was just him waving his arms at me had you know, a screwdriver or something. Again, if, if I'm dealing with a guy who gets in fights all the time, he may not want to exchange. If, you, if you're an athletic-looking dude and all of a sudden some little guy's coming up to you, he may have an edge you don't know about, no pun intended. So that's why he's, he feels confident getting into this fight. So I want to be selective about what elements in my grappling game, in my clinch game, that I put into play. Okay. Because, like, a full mount is a very dominant position. Uh-huh. Unless... The person isn't holding me. He's got a weapon in his hand. Or if his buddy's coming, he's holding on to my legs and just burying his head, waiting for people to come stomp on me. Because now I can't get up and just disengage. Yeah. So even then, there's a kind of a priority that we lay out in terms of the positional game, in terms of if I'm dealing with an actual fight, neon belly, much safer for me to do than full mount, even though it doesn't have the same level of control. That kind of stuff. Okay, on the back, hooks in is very dominant. But if I'm not sure that I'm that it's a one on one, I can't take the risk on falling the guy down, having him laying on my legs, and having his buddies come over and help him out. Yeah. So I want to be selective when when I do tie up, when I clinch, when I take the person down, that I take into account those other variables, uh, buddies and weapons and things like that. If I'm training self defense, okay. So I kind of have to compartmentalize because I'm not saying they're bad positions; they're very good positions, they're dominant positions, but they can be risky in certain contexts. Sure. Now, do you think it's important to not just, like, it's very important to train martial arts in a self-defense, with, with self-defense in mind, right? And there's many people out there that train martial arts with self-defense in mind, and that's the only style of martial arts training they do. They only do the, the, the knife defense stuff. They only do the street combatives type things. Do you think it's important or not important that that, that person that mainly trains in the self-defense materials also trains in the martial arts uh realm and doing more than just those types of techniques doing the quote-unquote sport techniques doing the just traditional martial arts techniques if i'm teaching if i'm training in jujitsu and i'm a guy that just wants to learn self-defense oriented jujitsu should i also be training maybe not as much the non-self-defense jujitsu techniques or is that not important if you're just a self-defense guy I think absolutely. And, and you know, when, when we're talking about training for self-defense, we're talking, like I said, about CPR. We're talking about very specific context uh-huh. to to apply skill. But in my opinion, and not to wrap up the cages, solely training combative type self-defense stuff is not the way to develop the skill. It's, yeah. a, it's a way of learning how to apply skills that you should have developed. And when In my adaptive striking program, we talk about a lot of dirty boxing content, grab the person by the head and stuff, I'm fighting off the single collar, t-shirt chokes, things like that. However, without a foundation in uh, a, a solid striking program, without being able to deal with a clinch or a takedown, uh, without being able to match and change levels and, and square your hips appropriately, you're going to get dumped on your ass if you try and do that. And if you only train in the combatives elements, you're not going to have reps under pressure to apply this stuff in real time. Okay. Now, going martial arts long-term, again, I'm not here to tell people how they should train, but in my opinion, they're missing so much of what you can gain yeah. from training in the martial arts if all you do is focus on the street stuff. Okay. Um, because part of what, what allows us to grow and build uh, as individuals, as martial artists, is in the day-to-day struggle, is in the discipline. Okay. It's in learning to be humble and learning to help bring up our training partners, help them to get better at things. Sure. Um, 
and all you know all the humility and and all of these things that that come into play through regular training. Yeah. Those are the things. So one, you're not going to get good if you're not training all of the elements, mm-hmm. and two, you kind of just spend your time thinking about all the the nasty elements of society. Mm. So you know. Yeah, it just, it like just people who think racist thoughts all the time tend to look like they're thinking racist thoughts. <laughs> they look like that in the face. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like you look like you're thinking about violence all the time. You look like an unhappy person. Yeah, it just opens up more possibilities when you train everything. When you train every possibility, it kind of goes back to that whole jujitsu gi no gi debate. It's like, listen, man, just train them both. You know, I'm not, I'm not. I'm not, you know, making fun of anybody that just trains in one or the other, but just train them both. You open up the most possibilities possible if you train them both. So why not do that? I'm not saying if you're a no-gi guy, you got to start training gi five times a week. No, just train gi once a week, even once every two weeks or vice versa. If you're a gi guy, train no-gi once every two weeks. At least you'll be open to more exchange possibilities that that your one particular style is not open to. Just like you should go and train with other people every now and then because you're open to more possibilities than what your school can bring in. That's where competition comes in. Absolutely. People get so caught up in their own their own biases and their own limited understandings, and then they shut the doors and they can't grow. Yeah. So they go, oh, no, this is the way to be, or my coach says this is the way to be, so that's the way to be. Um, incidentally, anybody who's interested in self-defense should be training with the gi, contrary to what a lot of people think. Okay. Because trying to hit somebody who's wrapped up in your jacket or your t-shirt is not as easy as you think. In some big fact, I will drag you to the ground <laughs> or throw you, pin you to a wall and shut down your stand-up game quick. Yeah. Um, <laughs> plus, it's good to learn how to choke someone with their t-shirt. Definitely. Um, <laughs> or their jacket or whatever. A um, nice leather jacket pulling on their neck. It's a pretty cool feeling. Leather no, jacket. No, even better, dude. Get Grab that grab that shreddy white beater, get a good handle, and wrap it around their neck <laughs> and just... Because even chin down, you can slice that in. They can't, you can't stop it. A big, thick gi lapel, uh-huh. it's hard to dig in there if a person's got their chin tucked and their shoulders up. You can do it with a t-shirt like a wire saw. And what if, what if uh, you're applying this, uh, this wife beater choke or this uh, t-shirt choke and the shirt starts to tear? What is your next option? What are you going for? Um, depends <laughs> on what my position is. If we're talking about specifics and technique, let's say you're um, standing you have, and you're there are plenty of, if I have standing chokes, then awesome. Otherwise I'm going to jump them and try and make it dominant, like a top position until I can disengage. But if you apply the choke correctly, it's not going to rip because you can take a white beater, wrap it, you know, grab it, like, uh, like pull it into a straight line, wrap it over a pull-up bar and do a pull-up. You can't do it if you grab the, just the collar or the strap, but if you get a good handful of material, you can dig that. You can you can use put a lot of strain on that without ripping it. Yeah. Even if it rips, you can still grab the cloth and use it. Okay. Uh, again, if you watch at Chris, my coach uh, Chris Howder, he has a clip on YouTube where you can see him just doing some free training with t-shirts and the shirt ripped, and he's grabbing you know different parts of the shirt and wrapping around rubber rubber pole head. So mm. it, it's still a viable tool. Absolutely. Wow. So everyone says, "Oh, you don't wear the jammies in the street. You don't wear a gi in the street. So <laughs> why would you train in a gi?" Yeah, but fight the other way. And but a shirt is very practical. Guys are just fighting in their chonies. <laughs> <laughs> now I have another question, and this is something that I've always thought about. Again, because I, you know, I don't like to get into fights, man. I've been into a couple of fights, and luckily they they got separated before it got too crazy. But what is, for those people who never really been in a street fight at all, completely never been into a street fight, and they're a martial artist, they've been training for 10 years even, and, and they're, they're preparing for a street fight, right? If you get into that altercation finally as a martial artist, what is, what is the end goal that you're looking for to safely finish the street fight like am i getting on top of him like let's say i'm getting on top of him i'm getting on top of him and i'm mounting him and i'm controlling this him or her's body am i telling them hey listen stop or else like how do you finish this fight how does the street fight finish you know what i'm saying right no i hear you at what point does it end yeah um (laughs) and i'll take it one step further uh because it solves a lot of problems at what point did it begin boom um so let's let's address that because a lot of times People, when you say, I'm going to train for self-defense, uh, here's a, today is self-defense technique day, and then you go, okay, if he gives me this punch, here's my move, you missed a whole bunch of opportunities to not be in a fight. Mm, gotcha. Okay. And uh, if we're talking about really looking at self-defense, how about, don't be a jackass. How about, 
How about if a guy's mean mugging you, move on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How about remember all the other cool stuff you're going to do that day? All the badass, you know, movie, you got a movie, you're going to go see your wife, you're going to play with the kids, you're going to go hang out with your brother, you're going to go first, or whatever you're going to do. You had all these plans, but now I'm going to deal with this and maybe have to go to the hospital or jail or whatever. Sure. Mm-hmm. But there, there's some that situations stuff. that are unavoidable. Yes, and I'll get to that in a second. But my point is, there are points before things go physical to mm-hmm. head things off. And that, and then that perspective needs to be taught. It needs to be appreciated. Uh, the guy that hasn't been in a fight in 10 years, he's doing something right. Yeah. Because there are opportunities, you know, that they avoid not daily, it. weekly, where I could get into a fight if I was so inclined. Right? Sure. This guy cut me off, and I want to yell at him, and I'm going to follow him, or whatever stupidity that people you do. You son of a, get out of the car. Let's yeah, stop exactly. Doing and now if he pulls over, I have the option to drive on, or I can pull over, too. I've done that before. But there are a lot of times that we get into fights that we thought were avoidable, but we put ourselves. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But let's say we ended up there. You know, I came out of the bathroom, I hit somebody, spilled his drink, oh, sorry, dude, and fight's on. Whatever. Where it ends, for me, or what the goal is, what we teach, is I'm always going to be looking to disengage uh, and try and, and de-escalate the situation, get get out of it, because it's not worth it. If I can, and he's continuing to escalate, you can see him building up, his buddies are goading him on, then I'm looking to, to stop it at the beginning. I, I'm, I'm a fan of preemptive striking. I don't have to let the guy hit me. Yeah, if um, they get in your red zone. <laughs> no pun intended. There you go. <laughs> exactly. But let's say he got the first shot, right? I'm arguing his buddy comes over, boom, hits me from the side because I was looking at, I was thinking the threat was directly in front of me. Okay. And now it's on. I got hit. I didn't go down. Thank God. And now we're tied up. We're fighting. Our process, and like I said, with, with the red zone prime, we, we teach it as a progression. We teach it as a, as a, uh, closed end system. Mm-hmm. It's not open end like jujitsu or something like that. It's like, here's our process for dealing with this very specific thing, which is a shoot fight. I'm going to crash. I'm going to dump him. If I'm going to go to a top position, I'm not going to, to mount. Maybe to cross side briefly, uh, only because if I stay engaged with him, I stay entangled with him, I can't tell what's going on around me or who's with him. Um, one of my coaches had a funny story about uh, he was driving home and he saw a man beating his wife on the front yard. He pulled over to, to stop it. Uh-huh. He gets into a fight with the guy. She comes down and hits him with an iron and ends up at the ER. So the lady, he stopped to save, all of a sudden blindsided him. So if I get too, too tied up with this guy, I don't know what else is going on. Yeah. So neon belly, arm wrap him, put him on his side, and then I'm immediately looking for an exit. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll give him a boot on my way out just to slow him down. I'm getting out of there. <laughs> okay. My, my, the end of this fight, I've got a wife and kids and a life and a gym and, an, and a career. I'm just looking to go about my day. I'm not looking for some weird conquest to prove myself kind of thing. So I'm not going to stay engaged with this person any longer than I have to. Uh He cornered me. I had to be in a fight. I've got to deal with it. And then I'm looking to disengage and move on. Does that make sense? Gotcha. No, that makes makes perfect sense. It always ends with me leaving. So everything leads to me having being able to get out of there. But I have to do enough damage to this guy yeah. that he can't. He's not just going to follow me and stay, and the, the fight's going to continue. Sure, or at least doesn't even want to. Right, Got right. If you get on top and go pound, 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 boot, you can kind of start <laughs> working your way towards the exit. And chance are he's not going to fall. Sure, we, we're kind of running out of time, but. Listen, man, we really appreciate it. I had a great conversation. <laughs> this was awesome. <laughs> it makes me want to train awesome, self defense even more, honestly. I had a great listening. <laughs> this is excellent. Awesome. Thank you so much, man. Um, uh, if I can give a shout out to, please, the, to please. the website, yeah. Um, if you go to rzthreatmanagement.com, that's the, the website for our business that kind of gives you the whole rundown. We also have a Red Zone Threat Management uh, Facebook page. You can find out about upcoming events. Uh, in okay. a couple of weeks, I leave, and I'll be teaching in Sweden and Czech Republic, mm-hmm. and then back for a week, and then off for a tour in Australia, Boom. and then back, and I'll be doing Germany and England, and then some stuff in the States as well. But all that stuff up on the website. You can check that out. Okay. Uh, awesome. You can find the book on Amazon. Uh, you can Google my name, Barry Wetzel, or, or Red Zone Prime, and anything else. But mm-hmm. guys, thank you so much. It was a little intimidating coming on here, considering your current roster. So, <laughs> I was like, okay, really? You're going to have Eddie Bravo on here? You're going to have Rafael or Yeah. Rafael Lovato. Lovato. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> John <laughs> Wayne Parr and then Jerry Wetzel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, really? Okay. I should have structured that so I came first. I don't want to go after these guys. 
So that was really cool, though, and thank you so much for having me on. Of course. No you're, problem. You're man. a gangster. <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> we'll talk to you soon, brother. All right. I'll be looking for that T-shirt. Yes, sir. <laughs> Take care, my man. Please. <laughs> All right. Later on, brother. Later. Just remember, the best street fighter is an Olympic sprinter. <laughs>